where you can go ahead and have a seat and open up in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2. That's where we're going to be at today. My name is Robert. I'm the high school pastor here, and we are continuing in our look at Christmas. We can call this the Christmas Eve Eve service, if you want. It's actually Eve 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 uh, service. So, you know, you guys are in that place. You're like, do we come to church Saturday and Monday? Do we just go Saturday? So we're going to give you a a bunch of Christmas. We hope you come back on Monday, but if you don't, you're going to get your Christmas fill-in tonight as well. But the last week, Pastor Chad kind of kicked off this look at Christmas by looking at the Song of Mary. And, and he went through the Song of Mary and explained the significance of that and also challenged us to think what our song was. What, what is the song of our life? What is, what is our life song, you know, both before Christ and after Christ? And, and are we allowing Jesus to kind of redeem and change our life song? And, and, and we're doing this because all throughout the Christmas story, we see these, these moments of song. As people respond to the events that are happening, they respond in music. And, and, and I'm not going to sing for you guys today. Um, sorry and you're welcome both at the same time. But, but all throughout this, we see songs that happen. And tonight we're going to be looking at the, the song of the angels. Now, the angel song is much smaller than the song of Mary and the song of Elizabeth and, and some of the other songs throughout here. But, but it's incredibly significant. Before we get to that, though, I just want to dwell for a second on just how we see angels in our culture today. Because when we look around, we got all these appearances, all these kind of cameos of angels all throughout our culture. We got, you know, them in movies and TV shows, and some of them, they're all like cute and like lovely, and others are like really powerful and like strange. You're like, okay, I guess that works. But you got all these different instances, but then Christmas comes and just everything explodes with angels. Like they're everywhere. Um, they're everywhere in Hallmark movies, but I don't have time to address that right now. We'll, we'll leave that for another day. Um, They're in the TV specials at Christmas. They're on our greeting cards, our Christmas cards, our decorations, our wrapping paper. We make cookies in the shapes of angels. Angels are everywhere, right? So so let's do this for a second. How many of you outside your home, whether with a blow up or some kind of light up decoration, you've got some kind of angel decoration in your yard uh, for Christmas? Okay, a few of you, not many, but a few. So here's where we're going to get you. How many have one inside on a tree or hanging your your stockings or something? They're everywhere, right? Everywhere you look at Christmas, they're angels. And see, our culture, when we see angels, we, we have this nice, like, warm, fuzzy response. And we're like, oh, angels, they're so cute. They're so, like, lovely. And, and yet the response of the people in Scripture to meeting angels is a little different than, than what our response is. So let's take a look. I won't spoil it for you, but let's take a look. Uh, Luke chapter 2. Let's read that together. We're going to start down in verse 8. And it says this. It says, now in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. They were terrified. They didn't see an angel and go, oh, how lovely, an angel is here. Hey, guys, go get Timmy. He's got to see this angel. They're like, what in the world? They're freaked out. But that's not the end of the story. Verse 10. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. See, the shepherds there were terrified, but the angels brought that, that first message of fear not. And what's interesting is if you look throughout Scripture, we actually see that same greeting almost every time an angel appears to someone. Almost every time it says that they were in fear, they were terrified, they trembled. Uh, and almost every single time the angel's message is fear not. But this time I think it has a, an even greater significance. Uh, because what I want to do is, is, you know, we've looked at the the traditional kind of Christmas story here of the angels interacting with the shepherds. What I want to do is, is pull out from, from their brief little moment of worship and declaration to God, I want to pull out two big truths that I think impact how we see and interact with Christmas this year. Uh, and so I want to just pull out two things that the angels give us here. And the first is that Christmas conquers fear. You know, when you look at the angel song, it, it's bookended with some uh, statement of fear or, or overcoming that. You know, their, their first word to the shepherd is fear not. 
And they go throughout, they announce what had happened, they have a moment of, of worshiping and praising God, and they end with peace on earth and goodwill toward men. It's bookended with this, hey, we don't need to live in fear, we have peace. And that's because Christmas conquers fear. Now hear me in this, it's not the... the December 25th overcomes our fear. It's not that, you know, us penciling it on our calendar, putting it in our calendar app on our phone overcomes fear. It's not that Hallmark and everything it's done for Christmas does that. If anything, the commercialization adds fear and anxiety and stress. But the heart of it, Jesus coming and intersecting our life overcomes fear. And I love that, that they came and said, hey, fear not, because I think all throughout the Christmas story, there's these pockets and moments of people wrestling with fear. You know, it starts with Mary. When, when she's met with the angel, it has a similar statement of, of not being afraid. Because Mary was certainly afraid of, of what this event would mean for her life. Think about the significance that her having a child would, would have just in her social context, what that would mean for her reputation, her standing in her community. Think about the, the, the fear that she had about what that would mean for her future marriage with Joseph and how that would take place. You add to that just the, the fear of having a child for the first time, and I don't know what that's like, but I can imagine because we've got two kids but then on top of that, you're not just having a child. Here is an angel saying, hey, this is going to be the Son of God. This is going to be the Messiah, literally the most important person that's ever walked to the face of the earth. Mary's like, okay, no pressure. I, I won't screw this up, I hope. And, and certainly that kept her awake at night, just wrestling with that fear of, of the unknown, of what was coming, of what was next. And you think about Joseph. The, the fear that he had, the fear of maybe this isn't all of the story. Maybe there's something else going on here. The fear of if I divorce Mary, what will happen to her? Will that mean a death sentence for her because of the, the laws of that day? If I don't divorce her and I continue in marriage, what does that mean for us? What will people say? What will people think? And then equally, when he's visited by an angel and told firsthand, this is going to be the Son of God. This is a child from God. He's got the fear of, oh great, I have to now raise the Messiah as well. And you continue all throughout the Christmas story, these people wrestling with fear. You have Herod, when he hears that a king is born in Bethlehem, he fears for his, his rule, his kingdom. You have the wise men, when they come to visit and they hear that, that maybe Herod's got some, some bad intentions, they fear for what might happen to Mary, Joseph, and Jesus if they tell him. And then if we continue with the storyline, you have the fear of everyone in Bethlehem as Herod issues a death sentence for all boys under two, just in case. There, there's fear woven all throughout the Christmas story and, and you're here tonight maybe wrestling with some form of fear as well. This, this may be woven through your story this year as well. Maybe, maybe you're fearing for a child. Maybe that, that hits home for you. Maybe you've got a, a health condition that your child's facing, or you're just worried about what path your child's going down in life. Maybe you've lost a child recently. Maybe you're wrestling through that and the, the Christmas story being so centered around a child just hurts even more than it does normally. Maybe, maybe you're here stressed about and worrying about and fearing for your health. You've got some bad news recently or you're worried about the test results that are coming next week. Maybe you're here and your fear is finances. You don't want the kids to know that Christmas almost didn't happen or it may not happen. I don't know what, what your fear is that you're facing today, but let me challenge you with this. Let me challenge you tonight to choose faith over fear. See, as we go through this Christmas story, we see that, that we are given a choice all throughout this to choose faith over fear. Everyone that, that's woven through this Christmas story, they are facing a moment of fear, but also given a chance to say, hey, I'm going to walk in faith. That Mary had to choose to trust God and say, let it be to me as you have said. Joseph had to come to that place where he said, I will, I will submit, I will move forward, I will trust. All of the, the people throughout this Christmas story had a moment of choosing to trust. And I want to challenge you today that whatever fears you're carrying, whatever stress you have, whatever worry is, is weighing you down, that you would choose to have faith in God and trust him. 
And I use the, the word choose very deliberately because, see, we have to make that conscious choice. We don't wake up one day and go, I'm trusting God. Everything's, everything's good. I'm not stressed about anything. I don't have worry. I'm, I'm good. It's a process that we have to come to, and it starts with us understanding that God is for us and that God loves us. See, Romans 8.31 simply says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? It starts with us understanding, hey, God is for us. What can be against us then? Throughout the Bible, we see this. We go to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. We, we've heard this verse likely if you've been in church many times, but Jeremiah 29.11 is written to people in the midst of conflict, in fear, of chaos, and God simply says, I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper, not to harm you, plans to give you a future and a hope. See, if we want to choose to have faith over fear, we have to first begin to understand that God loves us, that God is for us no matter what. And the second part of that is us choosing to have faith that he is going to continue to work. Because we can read God's force, we can hear that, we can believe it, but we have to have that conscious choice to, to make that switch and say, I will trust. And, and I love Hebrews chapter 11. It defines faith for us, and it says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The people in the Christmas story couldn't see with their eyes how God would work. Mary, Joseph, they couldn't see exactly how God would work through their situation. They just had to walk in faith. And tonight, you may not be able to see how God is going to work in your situation, how God can overcome the fears, the worries, the, the stresses, the burdens that you're carrying right now. But if you are a follower of Jesus, if you believe that this Christmas story is the real deal, you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, you believe that he lived a perfect and sinless life, and several decades after the Christmas story, he went to a cross in Jerusalem to be crucified for your sins. And three days later, he was resurrected as we celebrate on Easter. Then we worship the God that's over all things, that's in control of all things, that has no weakness, has no shortcomings, has no inadequacies. We worship a God that can literally do anything. And so everything that you're facing is doable for God. The, the fears, the anxieties, the stress, the burdens, God can handle them. Now hear me in this, that, that, that doesn't mean that we can go to God like the, the ultimate Santa Claus and say, okay, here's my wish list, here's my want list, here's my demand list for how I want this to work. Because God doesn't promise to take away every bad thing from our life, but what he does promise is that everything will work for our good. He will work even through the bad things in our life to bring about something good. He will redeem, he will restore, he will work through our situations and through our life to bring about good things even when it's full of bad. So trust that God is powerful and can overcome your fears. Trust that he can work through your situation because the angels want to say, hey, Christmas conquers fear. Jesus is here. He can handle your fears. But the second thing that the angels show us is that Christmas is for God's glory. See, the angels, they're there, and they say, glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth, goodwill towards men. And I love that the, there's a transition that happens there. As you're reading through it, there's a single angel talking to the shepherds, and then it says, suddenly, out of nowhere, boom, a multitude of the heavenly hosts. There's a whole choir of angels that's there, and they're all worshiping and praising God and giving God glory. Because while Christmas is a celebration of Jesus' birth, what it really points back to is God's love and provision for us. Because Christmas was initiated because God the Father cared about us. And so really, the Christmas event traces back to God the Father saying, hey, I love these people. I want to provide. I want to care for. I want to save. I want to redeem these people. And we can trace this all the way back to the beginning of the Bible. You look back, Genesis chapter 3, the very beginning. Adam and Eve are there. They're in the garden. Everything's great. God is like, hey, you got one rule. And they're like, sweet, one rule. We can, we can remember that, except we can't. And we're going to break the one rule that you gave us, and we're going to sin. And Genesis chapter 3 is, is they work through the aftermath of their sin and rebellion against God. There's a little fact we kind of skip over. It says that, that they needed clothing. They were aware of, of their state. They, they needed clothing. And it says that God came and he 
sacrificed an animal to provide clothing for them. And it's a little thing that, that we can gloss over, but in the very beginning of time, God is saying, I care about you so much, I'm willing to make a sacrifice for you. He was willing to make a sacrifice for Adam and Eve, and it was a, a, an indicator that this would be God's trajectory for all of history. And even there in Genesis chapter 3, God gives them a hint that, hey, I've got something even better coming. I've got a solution for this problem of sin that's coming, and it's going to solve it once and for all. And so God the Father is saying, hey, I'm willing to sacrifice, to redeem, to restore, to bring these people back to myself. And so when the angels are there declaring, they're not just declaring, hey, there's a, a new baby that's been born, but they're saying, hey, God has acted gloriously towards people. God has been generous. God has been gracious towards us. And it's all so that God could be glorified through everything. Even, even Jesus understood this. Hear this. Um, in John chapter 8, Jesus is talking about his life here on earth. And he says that he did not come to seek his own glory, but to point glory towards the Father. And then in Philippians chapter 2, we get this great description of Jesus and his mindset. It says, though he was in the form of God, he, Jesus, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See, it's shown us here that Jesus says, hey, I'm not subordinate to God. I'm not lesser than God the Father. We exist in trinity of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, all equal in their godness. But Jesus says, hey, as I came to earth, I came on a rescue mission. I came to serve. I came to put my agenda to the side so that God the Father's goal of bringing people back to himself could happen. And so as we look at this and we ask, why does this matter with Christmas? It's because the whole event of Christmas exists so that people could be brought back to God. The whole reason that Jesus came is so that people who were far from God, who were alienated and strangers, as the book of Ephesians tells us, could be brought back into relationship and community with God. And so we celebrate not just because a, a baby was born in Bethlehem, but because that baby was born so that he could go to a cross to take on our sin. And this entire event is so that God could be glorified. Because we look at this and we say, God is good for what he's done, but he did this so that people could come to a place where they worship and they proclaim the goodness of God the Father. So with that in mind, let me ask you this. As you look forward to Christmas in this coming week, let me ask you, how can you glorify God with your life this Christmas? Are you at the place where you're in a, a relationship with God, you're worshiping Him, you're, you're in community already? If so, how can you use the, the events of this week to, to bring glory to God? We see throughout the Christmas story individuals choosing to, to act in ways that would glorify God. The angels even here stepping aside and saying, hey, let's worship God. How can you glorify God this week? Maybe it's with you changing your priorities, your agendas. You're, you're looking at the new year coming up, and you're saying, hey, I'm going to reprioritize. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make this God thing a significant part of who I am and what my life is. Maybe, maybe you need to just take agenda of your life and say, hey, these actions, these habits, these activities are pulling me away from God, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut them out. Maybe it's you looking at, at your family situation and, and not just ignoring or, or overlooking a conflict or relational issue, but you saying, hey, I'm going to be the person of peace. I'm going to reconcile this. I'm going to forgive as God has forgiven me. Maybe it's you looking for some way to be unexpectedly generous. God surprises his people here with his generosity. So maybe you just are going to look for a way to be unexpectedly generous this week. Whatever it is, God's desire is is for us to glorify him and honor him with our lives. Because the angel said that, hey, Jesus overcomes our fears, and this Christmas event exists for God's glory. So how are we going to glorify him? How are we going to worship and praise him for what Christmas is? But there's a little bit more that, that I want us to look at today. If you look back at Luke chapter 2, we're going to pick back up in verse 15, because the angel's leave there, and there's a response that happens that I think is, is helpful for us to look at. 
And starting in verse 15, it says, When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. It says, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. My question for you today is, how will you respond to Christmas? Not just to getting a gift or the surprise of a family member coming in town or some other event that happens, but the actual event of Christmas. How will you respond to the Son of God intersecting your storyline? Because the shepherds had two responses that I think are helpful for us to look at. Because the shepherds first pursued God. They said, okay, we've heard this. Let's go see what what actually happened. Let's go investigate. Let's go dig deeper. What actually happened here? They didn't sit there and watch the angels depart back into heaven and go, hey, can you pass me the hot cocoa? I I, I want a little bit more over the fire. They're like, we got to go see this. We've got to dive deeper. We've got to investigate. We've got to go pursue who God is and what he's doing. And maybe that's your next step tonight. Maybe, maybe you're here and you're still checking out this whole God thing. You're not really sure what it means for you. You're not here and can confidently say that you believe in the story of Christmas. And maybe your next step is to grab a Bible. The Bibles that are in the chairs around you, we'd love for you to take one of those home and read it. And maybe you just need to go and read the book of Luke and understand who this Jesus guy is and pursue him that way. Maybe maybe you have been around a little while and you haven't really taken that full dive into who God is. Maybe that's your next step is just to pursue God. Because the shepherds pursued God, but they also praised God. See, they they went and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus there. And it says they returned to their flocks, worshiping and praising God for all they had seen and heard. See, they praised God because they saw what God had been doing. They they witnessed with their eyes. They they saw, hey, God is working. God is in action, and I'm going to worship and praise him for it. So where are the areas in your life that that you can praise God for? Where do you see God working? Where do you see him moving? Where have you seen God bless you and and change your life? And notice that that the shepherds could only praise God because they pursued him. And, And if you're here and you're like, I don't really have a reason to praise God. I don't really see anything good in my life. I don't really see a reason to be thankful and to worship. It's because you have not pursued God. You've not looked at how God's worked in your life. You haven't compared your life to the goodness of God and thanked him just at the minimum for being gracious and kind to you. The shepherds praise God because they had pursued him. So this Christmas, what will your response to Christmas be? How will you respond not to a gift that's open, not to the fact that he went to Jared or she went to Bradley Ford, (laughs) but, but how will you respond to Jesus? How will you respond to God intersecting your story? Because the angels here declared that that Jesus can overcome our fears. Jesus can can intersect our life and change everything. So will you live with thankfulness and gratitude for what God's given you? Will you live choosing to, to walk in faith over fear? Will you live your life in a way that glorifies God? This Christmas, amidst the gifts, amidst the parties, the travel, the family, the events, the decorations, the cleanup, everything that happens, my prayer is that you would embrace the song of the angels, that you would choose to glorify God and live with peace on earth as we worship and give thanks to God for his goodness. Let's pray.